the dirt tunnel. Deep under the surface of Area 51 was dark. The lights overhead had been smashed, leaving us with only one flashlight. Kish, my training officer, held the flashlight in her hand. She picked it up from a pool of blood near a dead man's body. It was my first day working at Area 51, and things had been going wrong all day. Landa, another first day trainee, stood nearby with a tight grip on his M4 rifle. Kish shined the light around, sending it flashing over the mutilated bodies of a dozen other security officers. There was blood everywhere. The reinforced metal door just ahead of us had been standing open when we arrived to find all these dead bodies. But there was no sign of whatever had done it to them. Kish had quickly shut the door, but now she seemed unsure what to do next. She didn't know what the hell was going on any more than Landa and I did. I heard something shift behind me. The sound sending an icy finger up my spine and into my brain. I knew by the way Kish and Landa tensed up that they heard it too. As one, we all turned around, readying our rifles. Kish shined the flashlight on a man standing in the middle of the tunnel, about ten yards away, his back to us. Fang? Kish asked. Is that you? The man didn't answer. His head twitched as he stood there, arms held stiffly by his sides. I saw the spot where the man had been lying when we passed. He was the one with the gory holes in his back who'd been pressed up against the side of the wall face down in a pool of blood. I just assumed he was dead. With those holes in him, it was nearly impossible that he was still alive. Fang? Kish said, starting toward him. Landa grabbed her gun. What if he's, I don't know, infected or something? There's no evidence that they can infect people, Kish said. You just finished telling us that you don't know what those things have been up to down there, Landa said, still gripping her arm. Kish seemed to take his point. She gripped the flashlight against her rifle's handguard and pointed the weapon at the twitching man. Fang, can you hear me? She asked. Fang's head twitched to the left and paused there as he looked back over his shoulder toward us. His eyes studied me with what seemed to me like callous disinterest. I pressed my weapon snugly into my shoulder, preparing to fire if the need came. Keeping his head just where it was, Fang shuffled his feet, turning stiffly around to face us. He didn't move his head until his body was completely turned around, at which point his head twitched again, straightening. There was something clearly wrong with him, and not just the fact that he had four holes in his chest as well as his back. Fang, what happened? Kish asked. The man's camo uniform shirt shifted outward as four crab-like legs shot out through the holes in his chest. He fell forward like a board, the four legs catching him and then propelling him toward us, even as four more limbs emerged from the holes in his back. Four arms, each with a six-clawed hand on them, branched out. All three of us fired our weapons, the sound deafening and painful in the enclosed area. Our 5.56 millimeter rounds blasted from our weapons at 2,970 feet per second, ripping through flesh and obliterating bone. But the creature kept coming. Getting hired to work at Homey Airport, also known as Area 51, is not as easy as responding to a job posting online, not even close. Most of the people who work there are members of the United States Air Force, but not all of them. Most of the security officers, known by the public as camo dudes, are private contractors. That's how I got my job working at Area 51. I had already been with the private contracting company for nearly 10 years before my boss approached me and asked if I wanted a new assignment. He'd seen I was in a slump. My girlfriend of several years had just left me, and he said that this new assignment might add a little excitement to my life. Of course, he didn't tell me what the job was, only that I would have to move to the desert to do it, and that it would be a long-term thing. I agreed easily enough. There was nothing keeping me on the East Coast, and going home to the empty apartment Trisha and I had once shared was like stabbing myself in the heart at the end of each shift. It wasn't until I was through the rigorous security screening and psychological testing that I was told where I'd be working. At first, I didn't know it was Area 51, because no one called it that. 
It was either Homey Airport or Groom Lake. But once I did a little research, I realized I'd be working at the famed top secret site where alien spacecraft were allegedly studied. Of course, I didn't believe in aliens. Not then. The move went smoothly, and I found myself a nice little house in a Las Vegas suburb. On the advice of a friend from work, I decided to get a dog from the local kill shelter. Her name was Luna, and she was a black and white border collie. I spent my first week in Vegas before the job started, getting to know Luna and allowing her to get to know me. She was skittish at first. She'd clearly had some bad experiences, but by the time the week was over, we were getting along well. I hated to leave her so I could go to work, but the job at Area 51 came with a raise, so I had no problem hiring a dog sitter to stop by and take care of Luna while I was gone. After moving in, I also set up a series of cameras around the house so I could keep an eye on Luna when the dog sitter wasn't there. I checked my phone several times while I drove to the small private airport on the outskirts of Las Vegas. Luna was trotting around the house as if looking for me. She seemed stressed. My heart broke a little, and I had to force myself to not turn around and go back. There was no way I could do that. If I didn't show up on my first day, I wouldn't have the job tomorrow. So I followed the directions given to me upon my hiring, parking at the airport and then going inside and showing my ID to the desk agent. The man at the desk sent me to a room marked private, where a second man greeted me and checked my identification. This man wore a sharp suit and had a stoic demeanor. His dark, bald head held humorless eyes, and he spoke in a clipped manner. He did a retina scan and asked three questions to which I recited nonsensical but very specific answers that I'd memorized. I'd been prepared for all that, but his next question caught me off guard. Do you have any open wounds? Open wounds? I asked, confused. Yes, Mr. Himes, cuts, even small ones, that are still healing or have been recently inflicted. No, I said. I don't think so. We need to be sure, the man said. Okay, well, I'm sure. I'm afraid that's not good enough. I'll need you to remove your clothes. You're kidding, right? I'm not taking my clothes off for you. I know this is a surprise, but it's entirely necessary. If you wish, I can get your training officer in here to verify the veracity of my claim. Jesus, what have I gotten myself into? I thought. I was starting to see why the pay was so good. Yes, please, I said. The man produced a phone and darted his thumbs at the screen for a few moments before putting it back into his suit and then standing blankly, staring past me. A minute later, the door at the back of the room opened and a woman in tan slacks and a button-down shirt walked in. She had crimped brown blonde hair pulled back into a ponytail, tanned skin, and the energetic air of a lifelong athlete. Mr. Himes, I'm Rebecca Kish, your training officer. You can call me Kish. We shook hands. What is the reason for me removing my clothes? I asked. To check for cuts, scrapes, or other open wounds, she said. I'm afraid it's non-negotiable. But you can't tell me why? It will all make sense in time, she said. I promise. If it makes you feel better, it's far less invasive than what women have to go through. In fact, they prefer to hire postmenopausal women. That only brought more questions to mind. I looked at the man, who still stood nearby, staring at the far wall. Okay, I said. Fine. Great, Kish said. I'll be waiting in the other room. She left the same way she came. I turned back to the man and removed my clothes, as requested. The man inspected me with the detached thoroughness of a bored doctor. When he didn't find any cuts or scrapes or other open wounds, I was allowed to put my clothes back on. Okay, Mr. Himes, the man said. This way. I followed him to the same door Kish had gone through. He opened it and ushered me into a room with about two dozen seats inside. Two of the seats were occupied, one by a middle-aged man in a gray suit and the other by Kish. She stood 
and introduced me to the middle-aged man, Troy Landa. He had thinning hair and a strong jaw. Despite the suit, it was easy to tell that he had managed to keep off the weight gain that so often comes along with middle age. It's Mr. Landa's first day as well, Kish said. Everyone else should be arriving soon and we'll get underway. I appreciate you both showing up on time. Kish's phone rang and she stepped through the door at the front of the room to take the call. The front wall was made of glass, looking out on the small airport tarmac, which baked in the sun. A passenger jet stood waiting about 30 yards from the building. I sat down next to Landa and pulled my phone out, checking once more on Luna. She was still pacing around the house, going from the living room down the hall toward my room. I'd shut the door to my room upon leaving so she couldn't get inside. I could see what she was doing because I'd set up three cameras in the house, one in the kitchen, one in the living room, and one pointed down the hallway. I really didn't want to have to put her in a cage while I was gone. That just seemed cruel. Good looking dog, Landa said. What's his name? Her name is Luna, I said. Dog sitter should be there any minute. Landa waved a hand. Dogs don't hold grudges. She'll be fine. Soon as you come home, she'll have forgotten about you being gone. I nodded, but it didn't make me feel any better. The other door opened and a couple of guys walked in, each wearing comfortable street clothes. New guys, one of the men asked. Landa and I nodded and then introduced ourselves. 10 minutes later, there were 20 people in the room, including me, Kish, and Landa. Kish let us out and got us loaded onto the jet. The flight was about 20 minutes. I got a window seat and could see the desert stretching out, brown, craggy, and desolate for miles in every direction. The sun was nearing the western horizon with undaunted purpose, generating the beginnings of a brilliant sunset. We landed and taxied near a cluster of two-story buildings where we were let off. Kish led the way toward one of the buildings. The tarmac was hot, having had all day to soak up the sun's rays. When we stepped inside the building, Kish told me and Landa to follow her while the rest of the guys went another way. We spent the next two hours going through safety training and filling out paperwork. I had a bad moment when I went to fill out my emergency contact and started writing Trisha's name on the sheet. I had to think for a minute and ended up writing my brother's name and number, even though we didn't have what anyone would consider a close relationship. These things were mostly formalities, They'd already done extensive research on us, but it served to drive the point home about how secret the assignment was. When all the paperwork had been cleared away and it seemed as if we were done, Kish came back to the table with two laminated sheets of paper, placing one each in front of us. On each paper was a list of rules that I read several times without coming to any sort of reasonable understanding of their underlying purpose. When I looked up to ask Kish what they were about, She put a hand up to stop me. Then, she recited from memory the first rule. If you or someone near you suffers a cut or any kind of injury that draws blood, you must immediately alert your supervisor or commanding officer. Then she moved on to rule number two. If you spill blood on the ground or in any of the tunnels, you must move with all possible haste toward the nearest building, but only after you've completed rule number one. Finally, she recited the third and final rule. If you fail to follow rules one and two, you understand that you will be subject to swift and severe punishment. Landa and I looked at each other, then up at Kish. What is this about? You are being filmed as we speak, Kish said, although I couldn't see any visible cameras. I need you to swear that you understand and will follow these rules at all times while on this property. What happens if we bleed outside? Landa asked. All will become clear as your orientation continues, but it can't continue unless you swear to follow the rules. Seeing that I didn't have much of a choice, I swore that I would. Landa followed suit. With that strangeness done, Kish took us to the locker room and showed us our lockers. She told us to change into the fatigues inside. Then she stepped over to her own locker and started to change getting into her uniform. I dressed quickly and checked my phone one last time. 
seeing that the dog sitter still hadn't arrived. There was no message from the woman, no missed call, not even an email. She was a no-show. At least Luna had settled down. She was lying on the couch, looking bored and sad. Leave your phones in your lockers, Kish said. If you ever carry your phone beyond this building, even by accident, there will be severe consequences. I shut the phone off and put it in the locker. A cluster of guilt stuck between my chest and gut. Landa and I followed Kish out of the locker room as she told us about the building we were in. This is the admin building, and it will be your first stop on every shift. You will never arrive at the airport in Las Vegas in anything but business or casual clothing. You will never leave here wearing your fatigues. There will always be a clean pair waiting in your locker at the start of your shift. As she spoke, we walked down a long hallway. She pointed at the cafeteria where we would eat our once per shift meal. We stopped at the armory, which was a room with a large locked cage inside. A severe looking woman sat inside the cage with an array of weapons behind her. This is where you'll get your firearm, should your shift require that you carry one. Neither of you will carry a weapon for your first week here, but that's the armory for future reference. Kiz checked out a pistol from the woman, which she put in the holster on her right hip, along with two spare magazines on her duty rig. A radio was clipped to the belt on her left hip. We kept moving, stepping outside at the back of the building. It was now fully dark outside, a full moon hanging in the sky like a spotlight blasting down on the desert. It gave the runways off to our right and the desert all around a ghostly hue. Okay, Kish said, pointing. See that building? She was cut off by the abrupt sound of sirens blaring across the compound. Landa and I looked at each other while Kish yanked the radio off her hip and brought it to her mouth, speaking hurriedly into it. I caught the words, Abnormality, failed sacrifice, and Reinforce Sector 3 from Kish's radio. Copy that, Kish said, rushing past us to the door we'd just come out. When she got to it, she turned to see Landa and I were still standing there. Come on, she yelled. We snapped out of it and followed Kish to the armory, where we each checked out an M4 carbine and two extra 30-round mags. Then we ran back outside in time to see a transport vehicle pull up next to the door. We all jumped into the back, joining seven other men and women dressed in fatigues. Some of them I recognized from the plane ride in. The looks on their faces caused a twinge of fear to stir up my insides, making me think that this wasn't a drill. This was the real thing. An attack helicopter whizzed by overhead as the transport truck sped across the taxiway. The back of the truck was uncovered, and I was tempted to stand up to see what was happening, but I thought better of it. We heard the sound of distant gunshots, which prompted several of us to look at each other, but no one spoke. Then we were off the taxiway and onto a dirt road, the uneven surface jostling us as we held our rifles propped between our feet with the barrels pointed up toward the star-splashed night sky. The gunfire changed and got louder as we approached. There was an explosion from up ahead, which caused me to flinch. I suddenly realized that Luna would probably starve to death if I were to die tonight. The thought of her languishing in that house until she grew weak and collapsed made me sick to my stomach. The backyard was enclosed, and I'd installed a doggy door so she could get out whenever she wanted, but it was little consolation. If for no other reason, I had to get through whatever the hell was going on here so I could get home to Luna. Then I could arrange for another dog sitter, a reliable one who could find Luna a new home if something happened to me. I had a sudden thought about not putting Trisha down on the emergency contact sheet. I regretted it, thinking that if I had put her name down and something did happen to me, she would be notified. The thought of her crying over my death gave me a sick sense of satisfaction. What the hell is wrong with me? I thought. There's bullets flying and bombs exploding, and I'm thinking about getting back at Trisha by dying? The truck passed through a gap in a barbed wire fence and then came to a sliding stop. Kish yelled for us to get out and create a perimeter. As we did, I looked around to see that there were several other vehicles and many other people already on the scene. Off in the distance, there was a smoldering wreck of something. Judging by the severed and scorched head that lay nearby, the pile of blasted parts had once been a cow. 
Two guys in jeans and plaid work shirts stood over beyond the smoldering cow with armed guards stationed nearby. They stared blankly toward a tunnel built into a hillside there. Judging by the tunnel's position, I figured it led underneath the fence line back toward the airbase. It only took a couple of minutes to realize that the danger was over, but we still stayed in our positions, creating a perimeter and scanning the area for anyone who didn't belong. Troy Landa, the other new guy, knelt nearby. What the hell did we just walk into? He whispered to me. I shook my head. I don't know, man. Maybe they just like to blow up cows to pass the time. Landa snorted with laughter. (laughs) Despite my comment, I didn't feel good at all about this. Whatever was happening here was bad news. After nearly an hour of hanging around the area, Kish ordered us back into the truck. We drove away, leaving scores of people to do their work. I gazed back at the area, which now had lights set up around the cow. Guys in hazmat suits were picking through what remained of the bovine, while people dressed in fatigues kept their weapons aimed at the tunnel. Men in suits were deep in conversation with men and women in lab coats as they stood apart, discussing something of obvious importance. We traveled back to the cluster of buildings next to the various runways of Homey Airport. The truck stopped outside the building where Kish, Landa, and I had been picked up. Everyone but Landa and Himes, back to your posts, Kish said. The rest of the camo-clad passengers disembarked, leaving only the three of us in the back. Kish stomped a foot twice on the truck bed, and the driver took off again. A few minutes later, we stopped at another building, which was one story, made of unadorned concrete, and looked kind of like a large bomb shelter. On Kish's order, we unloaded and then headed into the building. Once through the thick metal doors, Kish led us through a narrow corridor to another large metal door. This one required Kish to line her eye up with a retina scanner. Then she swiped a key card and entered an eight-digit code. The sound of large bolts disengaging from the concrete wall was followed quickly by a hiss like an airtight room opening. Kish turned to face us. Put the rifles over your shoulders, she said. Landa and I used the straps attached to our rifles to do what she said instead of holding them in front of us like we'd been doing. The door swung open and we walked into a wide room with two armed guards inside. They held their weapons ready, only slightly relaxing when they saw us come in. We stopped at what looked like an elevator where Kish had her retina scanned again. The elevator door opened. We stepped inside. Once the door was closed and we were going down, Kish spoke to us. This is not normally how we do things, she said, but we don't have much of a choice now. What you two are about to see will be hard to accept, but I need you both to stay calm. You were both accepted to your positions because of your past work experience and your psychological profiles. I have every confidence you will absorb and accept what we have to tell you, which will allow you to do what we ask without hesitation. But if you think you'll be unable to perform your duties to the best of your ability, then you need to tell me. It will not be held against you. This is about safety. That's the number one priority. So if you're not 100% sure you can function, tell me. Do you understand? Yes, ma'am, I said. I understand, Landa replied. Good. I can't stress how important it is that you be truthful. So, is it aliens? Landa asked with a hint of humor. Kish didn't smile. She turned around to face the elevator door. Hold the questions for now. Landa and I shared a look. He mouthed, It's aliens, while nodding in excitement. I managed a weak smile, my thoughts still on poor Luna back at my house. The metal box came to a slow stop, and the elevator door slid open to reveal a cavernous room with concrete walls and a ceiling three stories overhead. We stepped out of the elevator. Landa and I gazed around like children at a theme park. There were people all over the place, some working at desks clustered here and there. Others hustled around, talking urgently to their colleagues. Many of the people wore lab coats, while others wore business casual clothes. About a dozen of them had fatigues on, like Kish, Landa, and me. To the right, there were several large metal tanks in a row, each surrounded by scaffolding. 
they nearly reached the ceiling and were clearly permanent. Metal pipes snaked from them and ran along the walls, eventually disappearing through the concrete. There were large TV screens on the walls, and what played on the nearest one immediately drew my attention. It looked like footage from a sci-fi movie, with strange creatures crawling along an underground tunnel shown in grainy green night optics footage. Kish noticed me looking and said, Yeah, that's our first stop. Follow me. We moved over to the nearest screen. Take a look, she said. The camera angle of the dirt tunnel was high, indicating that the camera was on the ceiling. Two dark gray creatures scuttled toward the camera on four segmented legs that extended from a vertical hourglass-shaped body. The legs stuck out from the bottom of the hourglass shape, and they looked like they belonged on a crab. At the top of the hourglass, there extended four more limbs, two on each side. These were similar to the legs, but instead of ending in sharp points, they ended in six double-jointed digits, like armored fingers, three on each side of a narrow palm. These fingers crawled along the ceiling as the creature moved, as though it was feeling its way down the tunnel. As I looked closer, I could see no eyes or mouth. There was no head of any kind, as far as I could tell. Next to me, Landa stared up at the screen as the creatures passed under the camera, which shifted automatically, spinning around to watch the two things crawl away down the tunnel. What are they? He asked. We call them blood bugs, Kish said. Both Landa and I turned to look at her. Why blood bugs? I asked, pulling the rifle strap higher onto my shoulder. Follow me, she said, walking over to an empty desk with a computer. She sat in the chair, propped her rifle against the desk, and then got to work using the mouse and keyboard. After about a minute, she pulled up a video player. Watch, she said, hitting play on the screen. A dirt room that looked much like the inside of some 20th century mine came on screen. The room was empty, except for some wooden supports placed around the space. Then, from the right side of the screen, a small robot came rolling into view. It was a pretty basic design, like a remote control car, but modified slightly with a flat top. On the flat top, there was a small glass container halfway filled with red liquid. It was blood. The robot stopped in the middle of the room. Nothing happened for a moment. Then the flat top of the robot started lifting at one side. Soon, the container of blood slid off and spilled onto the ground. The robot backed quickly away. The camera started to shake. Moments later, the wall directly across from the camera burst open, and three blood bug creatures scurried in, dirt falling off their bodies as they circled the spilled blood. Using the recently vanished robot and the glass container for scale, I could see that the creatures were large, as tall as me, maybe taller. There seemed to be some kind of communication happening between the three creatures because they all stopped at once. The one nearest the container grabbed the glass with one hand and started scooping the blood-soaked dirt into the container with the other. But as its strange fingers touched the blood, it caused some sort of reaction. The creature vibrated as its fingers started to smoke, as though the blood was damaging it. I stared unbelievingly at the screen, watching as the blood bug scooped as much of the mud back into the container as it could. When it was done, the creature's fingers were mangled and melted. It carried the container back through the hole they'd created in the wall, followed by the other two blood bugs. The video stopped. Blood hurts them? I asked. Only human blood, Kish said. Almost like it's acid. Like the aliens in those movies, only the opposite. Our blood is deadly to them. But why human blood? Landa asked. And not any other type of blood. That's what the scientists are working on, Kish said. It's above my pay grade, but you need to know the stakes if you're going to work here. Why are they taking it? I asked, thinking I already knew the answer. We think they're studying it, Kish said. That video is old, from the 70s. Once we realized what they might be doing, we took great pains to keep them from getting more of our blood. We fell silent, considering the implications of that. So what was that whole thing with the cow out there? Landa asked, finally. That's something I can't answer with any clarity, Kish said. All I know 
is that we've given them a cow as a kind of sacrifice once every full moon for as long as I've been here. I don't know what went wrong today. They usually kill the cow and drag it down in the tunnels. I still haven't been briefed on what happened tonight out there. I've been with you two the whole time. Kish's radio crackled to life. She stood and stepped away, telling us to stay put until she got back. Landa and I looked at each other again. This is crazy, I said. It still didn't seem real to me. Seeing the creatures on a screen didn't help dispel the sense of unreality. It was like watching a movie or playing a video game. I couldn't wrap my head around one of those things standing nearby, taller than me, perhaps using its sharp fingers to tear through my soft human flesh. But would it attack a human? Were they hostile? If our blood hurt them, would they dare tear into us with their sharp fingers? One thing was sure. The blood bugs didn't seem to have skin like a human. It was more like an exoskeleton, a dark gray shell that only appeared to be weak at the joints. A commotion toward the other end of the large room pulled my attention outward once again. Landa and I looked that way, seeing that everyone was rushing over there. Without thinking much about it, I hurried over, Landa following closely. We joined the crowd around another television screen. This one showed a top-down view of what I immediately recognized as some kind of central nest area. It was a roughly spherical space with holes in the dirt walls that, presumably, led to tunnels like the one we'd seen on the first television screen. I didn't bother trying to count all the holes because my attention was fixed on the chaotic scene in the middle of the dirt chamber. Hundreds of the creatures were gathered in a clump in the middle of the chamber. They crawled all over each other obscuring whatever was happening down in the center. And something was happening. The way the creatures moved, some crawling away from the center of the throng while others quickly took their places, made it clear that there was a purpose to the seemingly random chaos. Since the camera was at the very top of the ceiling, giving us a top-down view, it made things even harder to see. But one thing that was apparent was the sheer size of the nest. The throng only reached about a quarter of the way up, meaning that the chamber was well over a hundred feet tall. The people all around us spoke with varying tones of fear in their voices. Some of them whispered while others cried out, saying things like, Where is this behavior coming from? Or, Has anyone seen this before? Have we checked the logs? They're doing something to the queen, a woman said. What are they doing to her? Meanwhile, more of the creatures emptied out of the tunnels, joining the throng building it up, causing it to grow. Someone said to change the feed, and a woman in a lab coat sat down at a desk nearby. She did something on the computer there, and then the feed changed. Now we had a view from a camera in one of the walls of the dirt chamber. The camera tilted down a little to put the mass of creatures into the frame, but we still couldn't see what exactly was happening. Suddenly, a single creature came into view, extremely close to the camera. One of its hands came down, the sharp fingers feeling around until they touched the camera. The strange hand paused for a moment, dark colored and obscuring half of the screen. Then the creature raised its hand and shot it back down, crushing the camera and destroying the feed, which blinked out and was soon replaced by a blue screen. The entire crowd fell silent, staring at the screen. No one spoke for a long moment until someone said, Switch back to the other camera. The woman did, bringing the original top-down feed up just before a creature crawled up onto the ceiling and destroyed that camera too. Oh my God, a man nearby said in barely a whisper. It's happening. What's happening? I asked. They're evolving, the man said blankly. Into what? I asked. The man ignored me, rushing off to do his job, whatever that was. I sensed a presence behind me and turned around to see Kish standing there. What the hell is happening? I asked. Kish's eyes dropped from the screen to my face. All we know is that it won't be good, she said. After the initial shock of the situation, everyone burst into activity. Get the backup cameras in place! Someone shouted. Ready the tanks! Someone else called. Get to your positions! A uniform man told the dozen or so camo-clad people. They ran away from the cluster and disappeared through a metal door. What do you want us to do? I asked Kish, 
who was speaking hurriedly into her radio. She held up a hand. The speaker pressed close to her ear so she could hear it over the noise. After a moment, she shifted the radio to her mouth and said, Copy that. Then she looked up at Land and me. We're just going to wait and see how this plays out. I swung my rifle off my shoulder and held it in both hands. It was better than nothing, at least momentarily making me feel like I was doing something. Back on camera, one is up! Someone shouted nearby. We looked over at the screen to see that there was once again a video feed up. The camera was moving swiftly through a tunnel. A moment later, it burst out into the central chamber. It floated above the throng, apparently attached to a drone. The creatures were still working towards some unknowable goal, their behavior unchanged from moments before. Tanks ready! A man shouted from the other side of the expansive room. A gray-haired man who'd been sitting at a computer, working furiously, now stood up as the entire room fell silent again. He looked over toward the tanks. I followed his gaze, seeing a man standing at some kind of control panel, looking over his shoulder. Do it! The gray-haired man said. Without a word, the other man turned his attention to the control panel, hitting a sequence of buttons before stepping back and gazing up at the large tanks as though they might explode. Then he turned to look at the camera feed, The drone floated near the ceiling of the hive chamber. For a long moment, nothing happened. The whole room was silent, watching the creatures swarm on the TV screen. Then hundreds of gallons of liquid rushed out of two of the high tunnels, spewing down into the chamber. As soon as the clearish liquid touched the creatures, they broke into a crazed frenzy. Gouts of vapor erupted as the liquid splashed over them, seeming to melt their exoskeletons. Soon, Given the torrent of liquid, we could no longer see the creatures. For a few long seconds, the chamber was filled with vapor and rushing chemicals, obscuring all else from view. The liquid stopped pouring out of the two tunnels, and the vapor started to clear, revealing a congealing pool of twitching limbs and melted creatures. Since everything appeared a grainy greenish color thanks to the night optics camera, I couldn't tell what color the pool was. Still. It wasn't hard to see that the chemicals had done some serious damage. The pool slowly dispersed through the lower tunnels. Several injured creatures crawled along the walls, slipping into the higher tunnels, disappearing from view. Did it work? Landa asked Kish. I don't know, Kish said. Who's checking the sensors? She called out. A woman seated at a computer said, I'm monitoring them right now, nothing yet. Kish still held her radio in her hand. She raised it to her mouth and said, What's your situation, Fang? She waited, listening. There was no response. Fang, come in. Still nothing. Sector two! The woman at the computer shouted. They're trying to get through the door! Sector two! And sector one! Shit! Kish said, looking at Landa and me. Let's go! She turned and ran toward the door through which I'd seen the other camo-clad people disappear earlier. Landa and I followed. The door was still open, but we closed it behind us. As we hustled down the concrete corridor, Kish radioed, requesting that someone lock the door behind us. She got no answer. What the hell is going on? I shouted as we moved. They're making a move, isn't it obvious? We figured something like this would happen. We just thought we would have more of a heads up. What do you mean, making a move? I said. A move for what? Kish shook her head as we came to a stairwell. Back in the 50s, when the creatures first came to Earth, the people who built this facility installed layers of metal mesh webbing around the colony in any place where there wasn't bedrock. They can't get through the mesh. They've tried. They can't get through bedrock either. So there's only one way out. And that's through us. So what the hell were they all doing piled up on each other like that? Landa asked as we moved down several flights of metal stairs. I don't know, Kish said. You don't know, or no one knows? I asked. No one knows, she said. We've never seen them do that before, at least not to my knowledge. And judging by everyone else's reaction up there, I don't think anyone knew about it. So what about the cow? Landa asked. What did that have to do with this? I don't know, Kish snapped. I don't have the answers. The cow thing just happened and I haven't had a moment to ask Nebraska about it. That's what I was trying to do up there when everything went to hell. All I know is that we've let one of them out to come get a cow once every full moon since they arrived. Usually, 
They just kill the cow and take it down into one of the lower chambers where they won't allow our cameras. Today was different. They did something to the cow. We came to the bottom of the stairwell, and Kish held up a hand to silence any further questions. She put her radio back on her belt and used both hands on her rifle as we approached a closed metal door. The door had a small reinforced window in the middle, which she looked through. Satisfied, she opened it, revealing another corridor. But unlike the one we'd taken to the stairwell, which was square and concrete, this one was roughly circular and chiseled through rock. Wires arced along the ceiling, connecting two blights at regular intervals that buzzed faintly behind metal cages. But as I peered ahead, I could see that the lights ended, leaving only darkness some 40 yards ahead. Fang? Kish called out, her voice quickly swallowed by the corridor. There was no answer. We move slowly and carefully, she said to Landa and me. Stay behind me and only shoot if you see a blood bug. Practice fire discipline. Bullets ricochet down here. An image of a starving and suffering Luna coming to mind. I tried to push the image away as I moved down the corridor, but it stayed there, taunting me. The tunnel wasn't quite wide enough for us to walk in a line, so Kish walked in the middle while Landa and I walked slightly behind and on either side of her, allowing for a clear line of sight. We heard only the sound of our breathing and our footsteps on the gritty ground as we approached the darkened portion of the tunnel. Is it supposed to be dark up there? Landa asked. No, Kish said simply. Gradually, shapes formed out of the darkness as we grew closer. When we were a few yards from the nearest shape, there was no mistaking it for anything but a human body on the ground. And beyond that body lay several more. How? Kish said under her breath. We kept going forward, moving into the darkness. The bodies on the floor had been shredded. I didn't want to look at them as we walked past, but I couldn't help myself. I stared down at them in shock and disgust. One man's face had been all but torn off. Another man's arms were gone, ripped away at the shoulders. A dark-haired man who lay face down against the wall had four large holes in his back. Their guns were on the floor, along with shell casings from spent rounds. It was impossible not to step in the blood. All this blood, Kish whispered. As my eyes adjusted to the darkness, I saw that the lights had been smashed, despite the little cages around them. But as we came to the end of the corridor, there was one thing we didn't see. Blood bugs. Kish knelt and picked up a flashlight from the floor, turning it on and shining it at the sizable metal door at the end of the corridor. The door was standing open several feet, allowing her to shine the light through the doorway into the tunnel beyond. It was empty. Seeing that, Kish rushed forward and slammed the door shut with her shoulder. She secured the thick metal latches to lock it. I don't understand, she said. Why would they open the door? Who? Fang and his group, she said. There's no damage to the door. It had to have been opened from this side. But why would they do that? On one side of the door, low down on the stone wall, I could see a small hole about the size of a golf ball. Maybe a small one got through there, I said, gesturing at the hole. Kish shined the light on the hole, which looked to be fresh. She knelt and looked through. Does it go to the other side? I asked. Yes, she said. But it's not possible. None of them are even close to being small enough to fit through there. They don't procreate? Landa asked. Not that we've ever seen. As far as we know, their numbers haven't changed since they arrived here. No births, no deaths. I heard someone mention a queen, I said. What does she do if she doesn't create new blood bugs? Nothing, as far as we can tell. But they won't let us see into some of the tunnels. Won't let you? Landa said. How's that? It means that there are certain tunnels where we've never managed to get cameras before, Kish said. Not for more than a few seconds anyway. The blood bugs seem to sense them and destroy them before we can gather any data. We've also tried radar to see into those lower tunnels, but we haven't had any luck. The creatures emanate some force that interferes with radar. But they didn't seem to care about the other cameras in that big chamber, Landis said. 
Not until they started acting strangely. Why? We don't know. We've learned remarkably little about them over the last 70 years. I heard something shift behind me. The sound sending an icy finger up my spine and into my brain. I knew by the way Kish and Lambda tensed up that they heard it too. As one, we all turned around, readying our rifles. Kish shined the flashlight on a man standing in the middle of the tunnel, about 10 yards away, his back to us. Fang? Kish asked. Is that you? The man didn't answer. His head twitched as he stood there, arms held stiffly by his sides. I saw the spot where the man had been lying when we'd passed. He was the one with the gory holes in his back who'd been pressed up against the side of the wall, face down in a pool of blood. I just assumed he was dead. With those holes in him, it was nearly impossible that he was still alive. Fang? Kish said, starting toward him. Landa grabbed her arm. What if he's, I don't know, infected or something? There's no evidence that they can infect people, Kish said. You just finished telling us that you don't know what those things have been up to down there, Landa said, still gripping her arm. Kish seemed to take his point. She gripped the flashlight against her rifle's handguard and pointed the weapon at the twitching man. Fang, can you hear me? She asked. Fang's head twitched to the left and paused there as he looked back over his shoulder toward us. His eyes studied me with what seemed to me like callous disinterest. I pressed my weapon snugly into my shoulder, preparing to fire if the need came. Keeping his head just where it was, Fang shuffled his feet, turning stiffly around to face us. He didn't move his head until his body was completely turned around, at which point his head twitched again, straightening. There was something clearly wrong with him, and not just the fact that he had four holes in his chest as well as his back. Fang, what happened? Kish asked. The man's camo uniform shirt shifted outward as four crab-like legs shot out through the holes in his chest. He fell forward like a board, the four legs catching him and then propelling him toward us even as four more limbs emerged from the holes in his back. Four arms, each with a six-clawed hand on them, branched out. All three of us fired our weapons, the sound deafening and painful in the enclosed area. Our 5.56mm rounds blasted from our weapons at 2,970 feet per second, ripping through flesh and obliterating bone. But the creature kept coming. We backed up, firing and firing. Something sharp hit me in the side of my left calf, and I winced, assuming it was a ricochet. Finally, with our backs pressed up against the metal door, the creature dropped, three of its legs no longer able to function. Two of its arms were also hanging limply from the holes in Fang's back. Landa bolted forward, jumping over the mess of the body and running down the hall. I did the same, not thinking about the dull pain in my calf, not thinking about anything but getting home to Luna and putting this shitty day behind me. Kish screamed for us to stop, but neither of us did. We ran, and pretty soon, I realized Kish was running behind us, no longer trying to get us to stop. But as we reached the door to the stairwell, she shouted again, commanding us to stop. Landa and I were slightly ahead of her, slowing at the door that Kish had closed on our way down. Stop, goddammit! She screamed. Don't make me shoot you! I stopped a few feet from the door, but Landa didn't. He reached for the latch with one hand. The bark of Kish's rifle from just behind me made my breath catch in my throat. A shot rang out, and a chip of stone flew from the wall to the right of the door, and then Landa's head snapped sideways. He stumbled and fell to the ground, limp. Looking down at the man, I saw the bullet hole in the side of his head, just above his temple. Kish stepped up beside me. Oh my god. I backed away a few steps, bringing my rifle up to my shoulder. A numbness seemed to spread through me, up from my injured leg, through my abdomen, and into my head. I didn't mean to do that, Kish said, turning to look at me. It was a ricochet, I swear. She noticed that I was pointing my rifle near her, and she grew quiet, shifting her weapon. Don't, I said, watching her rifle barrel inch toward me. It was an accident, Kish said. I'm not going to do anything. Just don't point that rifle at me. 
Don't point yours at me, I said. Still, she brought the rifle toward me. Himes! I fired, not really meaning to, not really knowing I was doing it until it was done. The bullet hit her in the chest, knocking her back against the door. She stared at me in shock, but she still had enough strength left to raise her rifle again. I shot her twice more, pulling the trigger on an empty gun after my last two bullets entered Kish's body. She slumped down to the floor, leaving a trail of blood on the metal door. Something cracked inside me as I considered with a distant comprehension what I'd done. That strange numbness was still there, somehow protecting me from the immediate mental implications of killing Kish. Glancing over my shoulder, I expected to see the creatures rushing toward me. I saw nothing but the empty tunnel. It gave me no comfort. Automatically, I pulled the empty magazine from my M4 and replaced it with a full one from my pants pocket. I still had one more magazine in my other pocket, making a total of 60 rounds. Moving frantically, I set my rifle aside and dragged both bodies away from the door, creating enough room for me to open it. I grabbed my rifle and stepped through. I pulled the door closed behind me. There was a manual lock on this side that would prevent it from being opened from the tunnel side, so I engaged it and headed up the stairs. I reached the door to the main room, thankful to find it still unlocked. I stepped through into the large chamber with the computers and tanks and televisions. Red lights flashed on all four walls, and people were engrossed in their frantic work. They were calling out sectors and communicating with people via radio contact. They've made it into sector one, someone shouted. We need backup at sector three, someone else said, a panicked edge to his voice. Is anyone there? Hello? No one noticed me as I ran through and tried to open the elevator. In my panic, I'd forgotten that Kish had a retina scan to get into the elevator. After pressing a series of buttons and trying to scan my retina, I realized I wouldn't be getting out without someone's help. I stepped back out of the elevator and looked around for someone to take hostage so I could get up to the surface and get the hell out of this place. I needed to get back to Luna. That was all that mattered. She needed me. When I got her, I promised to be there for her. Just like I'd promised Trish I'd be there for her. A promise I broke again and again while we dated. Because of my job. Because of this job that was about to get me killed. Stepping out of the elevator, I looked around, fixing my gaze on the nearest person with a lab coat. It was an older man with a horseshoe of gray hair who typed furiously on a keyboard, his gaze switching between two screens on the desk, each with complicated looking graphs and tables on them. I strode over to him and knelt beside his chair, shoving the gun barrel under his chin. His eyes widened as he turned his head toward me. Scream and I'll pull the trigger, I said. Do you understand me? He swallowed and then nodded with his eyes. Do you have the code for the elevator? Can you get us topside? This time, he hesitated. If not, I'll just go ahead and kill you, I told him. No, he said. I do have the code. I can get us out. Okay. I want you to stand up slowly and walk casually to the elevator. I'll be following behind you with the gun pointed at your spine. If you make a move, I'll shoot you. Hey, I had the same thought, he said. I have a wife and kids. I want to see them again. And I know what's coming. I know what they'll do. What will they do? They'll nuke the place. They won't have a choice. I hadn't thought about that. This new information solidified my determination to get gone. Fine, I said. We'll go together. What about the guards upstairs? The man asked. How will we get past them? Do you think they have shoot-to-kill orders? I asked. Not yet. It's not that bad yet. But if my estimates are right, the blood bugs will get out soon. We didn't kill enough of them with the chemical bath. There's still too many of them, and they're breaking out. Whatever had cracked inside me when I'd killed Kish now seemed to separate further. It didn't matter how many people I had to kill to get out of here. Getting back to Luna was the most important thing in the world. More important than the lives of anyone else here. Besides, if the Navy was going to nuke the place soon, what difference would a couple more deaths make? I'll take care of the guards, I said. Just get us up there. I stood, and the man got up from his chair when I motioned for him to do so. I looked at his name badge, which read, Waldron Raymond. I walked behind Waldron to the elevator. No one seemed to notice. 
Everyone was still frantic, calling out ideas, communicating on the radios or using computers, presumably to find a way to stop the creatures from escaping. Waldron scanned his retina. The door opened, and we got inside. When it started up, I shut my eyes and recalled where the two guards were in relation to the elevator. Are you going to kill them? Waldron asked. I opened my eyes and looked at him. You have a better idea? Maybe we can convince them to come with us. They're good guys. I've known them for years. Please, let me try talking to them first. Do you think they'll just let us walk out? I asked. Maybe if we tell them we're on a special assignment or something. Honestly, I don't know, Waldron said. Everything is compartmentalized here. They may have orders that I don't know about, but it's at least worth a shot to talk to them first. I nodded. Okay. I'll stand aside and let you try talking to them. But if I don't like what I hear, I'm coming out firing. Fine, Waldron said, not seeming happy about it. The elevator slowed as it reached its destination. I stepped forward into the right, which would put me out of the line of sight of the guards when the doors opened. The wound in my leg started to pulse with a distant but unmistakable pain. I was half turned, staring at Waldron's face as the doors parted. I saw a look of terror come onto his face. A second later, a blow bump flew into the elevator, slamming Waldron to the back of the metal box with its two front legs. It thrashed at him with the sharp fingers of its front hands, shredding his face as he tried to scream. His blood splashed onto the creature, eating through its exoskeleton like whatever chemical they'd used on the hive. But still, it thrashed and tore and killed as it died. I slipped out of the elevator, seeing that the two guards had been torn apart. Two twitching blood bugs lay nearby, limbs eaten through by the blood. I ran, turning sideways to get through the half-closed, now damaged door that Kish, Landa, and I had passed through on our way in. The sound of the emergency siren grew louder as I reached the front doors. When I stepped out into the night, I saw blood bugs running around. Helicopters shot at them from the air, while jets swooped down in other places, firing machine guns and dropping missiles. Several of the creatures attacked a troop transport vehicle, knocking it over and sending the security officers toppling me out. I stood in front of the low concrete building, watching all this happen in the distance. It was like walking into a science fiction movie. Gunshots sounded, explosions erupted, people screamed. Somewhere to the south, Luna whimpered in my new house. Of course, I couldn't hear her, but I could see her in my mind's eye and her imagined whimpering made me think of the times I'd come home hours late to find Trisha crying. I snapped out of it, looking around, searching for a vehicle I could take. Moving between two buildings, I made my way toward an area of the sprawling compound that I hadn't seen before. As I got to the end of the alley, I stepped out, only to see several blood bugs lumbering toward me with their spidery strides. I backpedaled into the alley and froze, holding my rifle up and ready to fire. The two blood bugs walked to the mouth of the alley, using the fingers of their front hands to feel along the ground ahead of them. Their back hands were up, as if testing the air like antennas. They paused at the mouth of the alley, just a few feet away from me. I still couldn't see any evidence of sensory organs. The wound in my calf pulsed with pain, prompting me to clench my teeth together. I resisted the urge to fire the weapon at the two creatures, not sure if I could even kill them with both magazines I had. So I waited finger on the trigger to see if they would attack. After a long moment, they resumed their strange march towards some unknowable goal. When they were safely in the distance, I continued my journey to find a vehicle. I didn't have to go far before seeing a helicopter sitting on a pad next to a two-story glass and metal building. Given how easily the blood bugs had attacked the troop transport, I figured the helicopter was my best chance. There was only one problem. I had no idea how to fly one. I recognized the helicopter as a Huey. It had no guns that I could see, and both the back doors were closed. Thinking it couldn't be that hard, I ran up to it and flung the pilot door open. I got in and stared at all the controls, nearly jumping out of my seat when I heard a low whimper from the back. I spun around, getting my M4 up and pointing it at a young man lying curled in a ball in the back of the helicopter. Don't hurt me he said, face streaked with tears. Don't hurt me. I noticed he had a flight suit on. Are you a pilot? I asked. He shook his head. Trainee, I'm a trainee. 
So you know how to fly? I've only been up a handful of times, he said. Besides, I heard them on the radio. They say if anyone lifts off without authorization, they'll be blown out of the sky. I looked around at the chaos still reigning supreme around the airport. You're going to fly us out of here, I said. I can't! I spun out of the seat and got into the back next to him, shoving the gun into his face. I've got to get home, goddammit! So if you don't fly us out of here, you're no use to me, and I might as well just kill you right here and now. Or would you rather take your chances in the sky? The kid's hazy blue eyes seemed to clear as he looked up at me, tears stopping. Okay, he said, sniffling. Okay, you're right. You're right, man. My leg wound throbbed again, making me wince. Out one window, I saw several blood bugs coming toward the helicopter. I slapped a hand down over the kid's mouth and ducked down so I couldn't be seen through the window. After several long moments, I eased up and glanced out the window again. I pulled myself back down again when I saw that the creatures were standing directly beside the helicopter. Strangely, I didn't feel any fear. Something told me that I was going to get out of this alive. It was my purpose. I kept my hand over the kid's mouth, but he took the hint, not trying to move or talk. After two minutes, I eased up to see that the creatures were gone. Okay, I said, letting the kid up. Let's go. The helicopter vibrated as it took off, yawing briefly to one side before the kid got it back under control. I sat in the co-pilot's seat, looking over at the kid. If we're going to die together, we might as well know each other's names. I'm Anthony Himes. Lonnie Cronin, the kid said as we put distance between us and the ground. Several attack helicopters circled a swarm of blood bugs about a quarter of a mile away, over near where the whole thing with the cow had taken place. In the light from the moon, I could see the bugs swarming while the helicopters fired. Cronin turned the helicopter away and headed south, just as I'd told him to do. Still holding my rifle and pointing it in his general direction, I scanned around, looking for aircraft that might be interested in us. From what I could tell, they were all busy with the bugs. Cronin put the nose down and we sped toward the southern horizon. We'd only been flying for a minute or so when bullets punched into the underside of the helicopter. Christ! Cronin screamed, jerking the controls and sending us hurtling toward the ground. The bullets kept coming, slamming through the floor and busting holes in the windows. The smell of ozone filled the helicopter as a bullet hit some electronics. This is it. I thought as we spun toward the ground. I'm sorry, Luna. The gunfire suddenly stopped, but I thought it was too late. The ground was coming up quickly, and Cronin didn't seem up to the task of preventing a crash. I shut my eyes and waited, feeling the G-forces pull at me as we spun around. But then the spin started to slow, and there was no bone-shattering impact. I opened my eyes to see that we were straightening out and getting higher again. Still unable to believe it, I simply stared out at the moon-glazed desert landscape. After another few minutes, Cronin relaxed a bit. I reached over and slapped him on the shoulder. Ha! <laughs> Just a trainee, my ass! You saved us! Cronin smiled uneasily. We left Area 51 behind, cruising over the desert. I noticed Cronin shifting the aircraft's position, turning us left a little. What are you doing? I asked. Vegas is southeast, he said. I've flown there on my training flights. I nodded. Okay, good. A brilliant flash of light erupted to our left and behind us. I leaned forward and peered out the side window. It felt like my heart seized when I realized what had happened. Acting on some morbid instinct, I got out of the seat and moved into the back of the helicopter. I looked out the rear window, back toward the glowing orange mushroom cloud that was sprouting from where Area 51 had once been. They fucking did it! I said to myself. They nuked the entire place! About 40 seconds after the bright flash, a wave of aftershock buffeted the helicopter. It wasn't much, and Cronin had no problem correcting afterward. I watched out the back window until I could no longer see the mushroom cloud. I went and slumped into the co-pilot's seat. Cronin and I were silent for a long time. As the buildings of the Las Vegas skyline came into view, Cronin cleared his throat. You saved my ass, he said. Thanks. 
Thanks for pulling me together. That makes us even, I said. I didn't think it was a good idea for us to land at the airport, so Cronin put us down in an empty parking lot belonging to an out-of-business department store. As I got out, I left my M4 in the helicopter. I was just glad I no longer needed it. Ow! Cronin said from the other side as he stepped out. What happened? I asked, coming around the front of the craft as the blades slowed overhead. I don't know, Cronin said, lifting the right pant leg of his flight suit to reveal a gash in his skin a couple of inches long. How the hell did that happen? He asked. My own leg wound, the one I'd suffered in the tunnel, pulsed faintly. It had grown oddly numb, so I didn't mind. There was a heaviness forming in my stomach, a feeling of fullness that was at once foreign and strangely comforting. It was similar to what I'd felt in the tunnel after killing Kish, but much more apparent now. The numbness spread up from my leg, giving me a narcotic-like buzz. Or maybe it was the fact that I just narrowly avoided death about a half dozen times. Clean it out when you get home, I said. Yeah, he said, still studying the wound. Well, I'm out of here. Got a long walk home. Cronin stood up, but he didn't say anything. He just looked down at his leg. I walked down the street several yards before stopping and glancing back over my shoulder. Cronin was walking away, but I saw some movement near the helicopter. Dozens of small four-legged creatures scurried away from the aircraft, venturing out into Sin City. There was something alarming about those creatures. The word hitchhikers came to mind, but that spreading numbness had reached my brain, and the alarm I'd felt upon seeing those miniature blood bugs, those hitchhikers, faded to a shrill ringing on the very edge of my perception. By the time I got home, I was feeling very full and very numb indeed. My keys were probably nothing more than a molten pile of metal back at Area 51, so I broke into my house with a rock through the window. Luna was barking, and she continued barking even as I got into the house. Her ears were raised, and she snarled at me as I walked toward her. Come here, I said, reaching for her. She darted around me and leaped out the window, running off into the night. I stood in my living room, feeling something moving inside me, shifting, preparing to break out. I dropped my chin and gazed down, unsurprised to see a set of four crab-like legs rip through my chest just seconds before my world went dark. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy these stories, be sure to subscribe to the podcast and check out some more of my episodes here.